Um, so as I said, this is migrating a live database into RDS with no downtime. Uh, but what the talk should be called is how we thought we were going to migrate into RDS with no downtime and what actually happened when we tried it. Um, now, the plan should have worked. It's just um, there were a few roadblocks on the way that, uh, that we could, could, could not get past. And I'll explain all of that and how, uh, how we hope to resolve it in the future. Um, so just a bit about our installation. Actually, before I even get there, I tend to talk really fast. If I'm talking really fast, slow me down. If you have any questions, ask me uh, in the presentation because I timed this out and I'll probably be way too fast. So a bit about our installation and what we do. So we uh, have a completely isolated production environment in AWS. It's not connected to any other part of our company. Um, so that, that's where everything is. We have multiple databases that host everything from live transactions, payment details, foreign exchange quotes, and the trades associated with those, fraud tracking, audit records for PCI, anti-money laundering, um, all of those uh, things. And then we have, right now, dedicated EC2 hosts for Postgres installations. And we do backups to S3. So pretty much the standard five years ago recommendation on what you should do to host a database in AWS. Um, but things have evolved, so we're trying to evolve with it. So what do I mean by no downtime? What I mean there is no disruption of the service. Um, so we have an SLA that guarantees five nines uh, outside of maintenance windows. Um, not quite the SLA that GE presented yesterday, which is absolutely amazing. Um, but it's still pretty limited, and we have very limited opportunity to have whole service outages for upgrades and, uh, and migrations. So we have to plan the evolution of the service accordingly and make sure that we have uh, things so that we can swap nodes in and out as we upgrade them. Um, customer service doesn't count towards um, uptime. I don't really care if the CSRs can't get to the database for five minutes. That's not my problem. Um, yes, it is a problem, but it matters more if we lose 1,000 transactions for a customer because we're down. Uh, administrative functions also don't count. So this includes things like fraud screening. You know, their SLAs are on, on uh, the order of hours to review transactions. So again, I don't care if it's down for five minutes. Uh, and merchant access, so if a merchant comes in and wants to see details about their transactions, again, I don't really care if it's down for five minutes. They care, and they will yell at us, but you know, we'll send them email and smooth it over. Uh, the only thing that really matters is payments. Um, so uh, the outline of how we were going to do this uh, is we were gonna determine a reasonable plan, a plan approach to migrate to a multi-AZ RDS installation so that we have uh, true redundancy across multiple sites in AWS. Uh, we're gonna change everything else after. So we were not planning to do a wholesale refactor of our system as we migrated it. Okay, we're going to get move this, get it working, and then change everything else because we have grand plans for using re lots of read replicas and changing over um, lots of components of our system to take advantage of all the things Grant talked about yesterday. Um, but that's a second step. Um, set a deadline, because this actually does need to happen, because the admin current administrative overhead that we have inside the company is too high. Um, we're not DBAs. Um, we're not experts. We just sort of pretend to be sometimes. Um, and then, of course, submit a talk. Uh, because what could possibly go wrong if you have a deadline and it has to be done? And um, yeah. <laughs> so the plan was to create a replica of the current installation, work out all the details, keep good records for the talk, of course, but actually for the audits, um, rerun all the tests to make sure it's all 1 a.m. proof. Um, because even though we deal with payments everywhere on the globe, it turns out that 1 a.m. is the best time to do it, even though that's the middle of the day in Australia. I have no idea why people don't buy things in the middle of the day in Australia. They buy things at exactly 5 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> measure the side effects and go through it again to document everything to make sure it's 1 a.m. proof, because it has to be really idiot proof. 
Um, so start with the worm. So this is a write-only, read-many database that we have. Um, this is a dedicated database to storing events. We keep audit records of everything. Every request and response that goes in and out of the system, we need to keep a record of it. Um, so we have detailed timing on this. Um, actually, th it's interesting, this, uh, this system started as a finger pointing exercise because we were having an issue with one of our fraud partners and uh, they didn't believe it was their fault, so. <laughs> anyway, uh, there are no updates to this system. It's for auditing and diagnostics only. Um, so we can afford to have delayed read updates. So this is perfect as a first, first test. Um, the audit and diagnostics can usually wait, um, but we can't afford to lose the rights. That, so those were the constraints on moving this database. So um, the plan for this one is to use DMS to migrate all of the data, switch all the reads in the system to use the replicant, which is the soon to be new master, uh, verify the data integrity, actually that should be swapped, um, then switch the writes. Um, now to switch the writes, because it's still actively writing to the database when we're gonna switch, um, the plan here, and it do, this does actually work, is to bump the sequence numbers by a reasonable amount. So basically what we've done is we've measured the, the average number of writes that happen in a certain window, we're gonna double that, bump the sequence numbers by that, and then any delayed writes that happen in the system to the old master while things are switching over um, will just get propagated into that window of, uh, of sequence numbers that is not going to be used by the new master. So once we do that, we switch the DNS records, wait for the old bit databases to drain, uh, and let DMS finish. So this is the plan. So the first lesson is uh, max replication slots. You actually need to increase this. If you're already doing replication, it's likely that all your slots are being used by your current replication process. If you're not doing replication, you need to read about this and see what it does. Um, this needs to be increased by the number of tasks you're going to run. So DMS does tasks by schema. So if you only have one schema, you technically only need one task. Um, but uh, we have a lot of schemas, so we had to increase it by a lot. Um, the next one is max wall senders. Um, again, if you're already doing replication, you'll just have to increase this to accommodate for sending to another uh, sync. Um, but if it's set as zero because you're not doing anything, then you need to increase it. Um, and then wall sender timeout, uh, we actually set that to zero on ours because we wanted to make sure it was consistent. Uh, and then there's some changes in HBA conf that you need to make. Um, if your system is locked down, uh, likely you're not gonna have access open to just any instance you create on EC2, um, which includes a DMS instance. So um, you need to allow for that. And this is specifically what we put in to ours. Uh, we just said host replication, um, the user and the actual IP address. For some reason, um, sorry, the super user also obviously needs replication permission in the, uh, in the privileges of the database. Um, so we did that and then uh, we ran into an issue, uh, which was this nice log message, um, which is basically telling you that your data is being truncated. So that I thought was a little bit more than a warning. Um, um, so, and then this one happened, which was um, a foreign key. So the first test that we ran, we actually um, didn't do the recommendation, which was to have DMS migrate the schema for you. We decided to uh, make up a new RDS instance, install the schema, and then tell it to migrate into that. The problem is your schema likely has lots of foreign key constraints, li likely has indexes, uh, likely has a lot of things in there that the first initial bulk load of DMS is not going to play nicely with. So uh, the first test failed uh, because text is considered a C lob type by DMS. So um, 
and the thing, and don't load your entire schema. <laughs> Either let it do it or just do the basic tables. So the second test we did was full lob, but it was slow, like really slow. We let it finish and it took nine days, almost 10. Um, this was uh, 100 million rows, about 50 gigabytes. You'll get the comparative times in a minute. They're quite, uh... the third test seemed to work. And what we did there is we ran it with lob truncation, but we set the truncation at double the maximum uh, length of any octet thing in the, in the database. Uh, and that finished in two hours and eight minutes. So that much, 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 much different. Um, but did it work? Well, the reality is we thought it worked and we actually got to the point of switching everything. So we checked, everything seemed to indicate it did, like everything, all our metrics, all measurements of all data consistency um, seemed to work. Uh, we switched over our production readers to use it and everything looked fine. Um, writes were still on the old master. So DMS was responsible for migrating those changes over to the, uh, to the RDS instance. Um, but that was really it. All, all of the reads were happening off of the, uh, off of the RDS instance. Um, so continued to migrate. Unfortunately, we had corrupted records. And this was weird. Um, and we still don't really have an explanation for this. Um, it is something that the DMS guys have no idea how it happened either. So we're still, we're still wondering about this one. Um, and it only happened after the initial load. So it's something about the streaming replication service that is messing this up. So that, that's a bit of a hint, but I don't really have the answer there. So it's not really fair. Um, other things we learned, uh, functions are not migrated. That might be problematic for you. It is for us. Our entire service is written as if um, uh, the database is basically an RPC server. So the only access that any of our apps have into the database is by function. So the functions aren't there, it kind of doesn't work. Um, the data is there, it's great, but um, can't use it. Uh, indexes are not migrated, that's a good thing, um, but it's also a really good thing to know ahead of time because if you try to use your database without the indexes, things are not gonna go so well, so you need to know that you need to recreate those. Um, Constraints are not migrated. Again, that's for the initial bulk load of data um, because they want to be able to do one table at a time and if the, if the ordering of that matters and there's interdependencies of it, resolving that would just be stupidly complicated. So they're not migrated. Um, there's likely, uh, likely to facilitate the bulk loading, but it could be done after. So that, that could be something that DMS could do for you. Um, so basically what you get is just the basic table layout. That's it, okay? The, the tables, the columns, the types are all right, but none of the interrelational uh, parts of, like the relational part of the relational database is not really there, but your data will be. So what we did is we used pgdump to get all those pieces that were missing. Uh, specifically, we used uh, pgdump minus s uh, out to a file uh, which just dumps the schema. It doesn't dump any of the, uh, the data in there. Um, we edited it quite a bit to remove all the table creation, remove any of the sequence updates because of course we didn't want the new one to be doing any sequence stuff until later. Then we did uh, DMS full load with ongoing changes um, which will import all of the data and then start migrating changes as they happen. And then when the full load is complete, then we load that file into the database. Um, just an aside, when doing this, when two people do this command and they do it on different hosts and one person edits it and the other person doesn't and the person, that, the host that didn't get the edits loads the file, doesn't work so great. So this is actually, I said it, this is the third test, but it's actually the fourth one, but. Uh, what, so what that gets you, your data is loaded, ongoing changes are migrated, your functions are now in place, your indexes are recreated, uh, your constraints are back, um, and basically you have a mostly functional database, okay? Except for the sequences, everything is there. 
Um, so how do you do the sequences? Uh, just before I get that, um, indexes take a long time. So adjust your console timeouts accordingly if, uh, if you have them. You, if you could turn on some kind of ASCII progress meter for indexes, that would have saved our first run of it, but uh, PCI is fun. So <laughs> um, if you don't know console timeouts for PCI need to be set. And so we needed to actually write down that we needed to disable them during this process. So, uh, so the sequence update itself is something like this. Um, now this is what we did to generate uh, the SQL command that we would need to run on the RDS host. So we ran this on the, just the EC2 installation of Postgres to get the command that we would need to run on the other host. So select the maximum one, add 10,000, from the milestones and then um, then create this text to, to do it. I don't know why you can't do this in line, but you can't. You have to select it into a variable. It's very strange. <clears throat> so one last test that we did, uh, this time it was the right instance type uh, and it took 29 minutes to do the, the initial load, so not the two hours and eight minutes um, that it took before. Um, we suspect the IOPS for the destination made the difference, and that makes sense when you consider the fact that the first four tests that we were doing were on a DBM3 X large, and the actual target that we were going to was a R3 2 X large, which has a significant bump in IOPS. Um, but it still started to corrupt the data after the first load. So we, we kind of, we thought maybe it was an anomaly, um, but it, it obviously wasn't, it kept happening every time. Um, and we didn't want to run long-term without the full lob. So again, we were, we, do, we were doing truncating of the lob up to a certain point, which was double what we had in the database. But of course, we don't know what's coming, right? So because, because we're logging everything that is sent to us in like as a request or as a response to one of our requests out to a vendor, um, we don't know if some idiot is gonna respond with an inline image, right? Which happens, unfortunately. Um, so we know the length of the longest record, but we don't know what's coming. So what do I mean by corruption? This kind of thing. So the data, by the way, this, this was, created before the JSON type, before the JSON B type, so it's just a string that is representing JSON. Um, but yes, the only difference there is that there is a single quote at the beginning of the second one. Uh, there are other forms of corruption that happen where it like, truncates it in a weird spot that's like, like it would take, a, just for an example, we set the truncation to be 200 kilobytes. And we would have some of them show up that were truncated 20. The, the data was 25K, but it truncated it at 20K, and we have no idea why. Um, so that's just uh, something interesting. This, this is actually what triggered us to, to find out that this was happening, because the people doing our fraud screening were looking at this data, and the admin UI was picking up on this, and like, well, basically an intermediate node was saying, that's not valid, Jason, I can't send that back to the UI. Yeah. It was only the only the text, yeah. So on, yeah, only the lob data types were being corrupted. <clears throat> so next, yeah. It's only the new data. So what's interesting is you know we did. Um, so we did an initial load with this data, and that, that all worked, but something got corrupted after, after that point, right? But, so one of, these corrupt, one of these records was corrupted in the migration, but then we tried again, which included that set, and all of that worked fine, and then the corruption happened after that, and then we did another test, and like, it was obviously something in that, it was nothing to do with the source data itself. It's very, very strange. Um, 
so next, well, we said, okay, well, we'll put that on pause for a minute and uh, try the important database. So this is not the, uh, the write-only database. This is the database that has um, basically the entire company in it. It's about 75 interrelated tables of live transactions, order details, payment details, fraud, foreign exchange quotes, remittance data, all this kind of stuff. The normal evolved mess that you have in your company that's been there for five years. You start out with a really nice schema and then life happens. <clears throat> Just a minor detail before we, that we ran into here, um, C. So we had this function forever um, as part of our normal EC2 instance. So what this is, is just a function rename, really, okay? So it's just referring to one function inside of a library that happens to be written in C. But because RDS considers C an unsafe language, which I understand why, because you could get it to do anything you want it to, um, this is not allowed. Now, it's, I, I've, I've debated with them whether this should be allowed to reference a part of a library that's actually allowed as an extension in RDS, but uh, it's hard. Um, so we ended up replacing it with this, uh, which is unfortunate because this, even though it is the exact same function, you see here it's UUI generate v4, edit the UUI DOSSP extension. This is 50% slower because it's running um, as PL, PGSQL instead of just referring to the C function. But that's okay because you should remove uh, the UUID OSSP extension from your life and replace it with PG Crypto's implementation of this, which is more than twice as fast as the other one, so it makes up for it, but this is still half as fast as it could be um, if it was just referring to the library implementation of PG Crypto's UUID generator. So. All of that just so we could type uuid.generate instead of pgcrypto.genrandomuuid. <clears throat> but that's, that, that's a tangent, so just don't use that other library. Um, then we came to another problem. Um, and this time, it, it was kind of worse. So hstore is not on the list of supported data types. Um, and in case you're interested, JSONB isn't either, which I kind of understand, uh, but HStore has been around for a long time. Um, it has to do with the fact that you are taking the, you're trying to take the representation of that data and ship it across in a transparent way into another database, which may not have that mapping. Because remember, DMS is not strictly for migrating from database type X to database type X. It can, it's a, it's a multi-database mapping technology, which is really cool. Um, so I understand why it doesn't have this, but it'd be really awesome if it did, because then we could, then we could use it. Um, just another tangent. Um, while you're figuring out what to do next, um, um, so this is a message I sent. Uh, we used up quite a bit of our disk space uh, because while you're figuring all this stuff out, Postgres is still working. It's still in the background trying to make sure that um, you aren't doing something stupid uh, so that when the replication endpoint comes back up, it can ship all the logs over there and make sure it's consistent. Um, so that set off alarms in our system that it was filling up disk space, so don't do that. Um, if you're going to turn off replication to figure out what to do next, turn it off completely. Um, so we didn't get that far. Um, because we used some Postgres specific types like HStore uh, and actually our next install, or, sorry, our next release of the database uses JSONB, so we kind of be worse off there, even though those are supported by RDS. So there's no problem with us putting our installation in RDS, it's just a problem with the migration of data. So we use HStore in about five different tables, doesn't like it yet, um, and we don't really have any other clever, clever schemes to deal with that. Um, it's possible that we could do something there, but, um, so we, but we stopped. 
Um, so some recommendations uh, for the RDS team. Um, support all the Postgres data types. Harder than it probably sounds. Um, but if you can't do them all, uh, some kind of warning or error at the very beginning of the process would be really awesome. Um, so there is the uh, schema translation tool service. Can't remember exactly what it's called. Um, and there is the uh, connection test that you can run when you're setting up your DMS tasks. Um, those check basic connectivity and, and you know, load up uh, what schemas are there. If they could also scan the tables and see if all the data types are, are supported, and so you're actually gonna be able to ship that data over, that would be, that would be great. Um, fix the full lob migration. I know it's in progress, but uh, it should not take 120 times longer than uh, truncating, um, especially if 99.9% .9 of your data is below the chunk size there. Um, I realize that the implementation of that is probably wacky, but uh, it's, it's definitely something that m might have contributed to the data corruption. We're not really sure. Um, we didn't have time to test that, but that is something that we would be very interested in testing if it didn't take 10 days to get the initial load to go in. Um, another is uh, DMS instant types. Um, we really have no idea what the difference is. There's no uh, guidance on this. There's no indication of what's impacted by the selection. Um, so like for example, the instant storage on there, we, we couldn't really figure out what that was. Um, DMS instant storage, uh, I have no idea what it's for because it is just shipping data from one side to another. So it, like, I have an option to choose storage on the DMS instance, but I don't know, I don't know what it impacts when I'm, when I'm selecting that. Um, figure out the data corruption. I can send you any data that you want if you, want, if you need help. Um, <clears throat> no idea why it would happen. There's nothing special about what we're doing. It's just text. Um, uh, design for novice users because we want, like a key motivator for us going to DMS, uh, not DMS, key motivator for us going to RDS is because we don't want to take care of the, the minutia of the low, low level details of administering Postgres. Um, we want to offload that. Um, so we are by definition not experts. Um, and uh, I have no idea why it couldn't uh, resolve an internal uh, name, but it couldn't. We have to. We had to use an IP address for the uh, the source and the destination. That that could help. Uh, just one more. Um, the status bar. It currently indicates the percentage of tables migrated. Now, if you have 80 gigabytes of data on three tables, that doesn't. What happens is you sit at zero for a while and then you sit at 33% for a while, and then you sit at 66% for a long while because one of the tables is much bigger than the other. Um, so some better method of that could, could be good. So are we done? No. Can we use DMS? Not yet. Can we use RDS? Yes. Um, but we want notify lesson to work soon because that's something we can't move over right now. So we have another database that we know we can't move because Notify Listen is not a supported extension. So it'd be good if that would work. Um, so what now? We go back to old school methods, um, which is very close to what we were trying to do with DMS, um, but shouldn't have any of the corruption problems. So for the worm data, we're going to do a manual replication, bump the sequences, update the DNS, backfill the updates basically exactly what DMS was going to do, except the, the backfilling process that DMS was going to do with the ongoing changes, migrations, um, we can do just by, just by doing a select and, a, and, a, and an apply. Um, the payment database is a little harder. We're going to backfill as much as possible because there is a lot of historical data in there that doesn't change. Um, but then we're going to have to stop everything, dump or store and eat into our uptime budget. So that kind of sucks. Um, but that's, that's it. So unless anybody has any better ideas, 
um, that is the end of my talk. <laughs> Yeah, 952, or sorry, the source and destination were both 94. Yeah, I can't remember the minor. The H store? I, I don't know, it's just not there. Um, this, it just says these are the, the ones that we support and it doesn't give any guidance on why they don't support other ones. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so DMS doesn't actually care where your on-premise uh, one is, as long as it's just a, a, a normal um, Postgres installation. You can't go right now, uh, you can't go with ongoing replication changes from RDS installation to RDS with using DMS, but you can. Uh, no, not yet, but it will be. Um, Yeah, sure. Um, so basically it's a select. <laughs> so um, the backfill of the updates on the, the worm data. Um, so basically what we're gonna do there is, because it's, it's just records go in and I get a sequence number, right? So um, that's just an ever increasing number. We just select everything, move it over to the other one. Um, and then we can do just select the max ID out of those three tables that's in the migrated table, and then select everything that's greater than that in the old in the still master. Uh, dump that and restore it. It's pain. That's why we wanted to use TMS because it would do it for us. Three weeks ago. Sorry. Three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. No, it it I, I will qualify this. This does work awesome, um, except for the like for the for the worm data. It would have worked perfectly if it wasn't for that data column that we had, and. Uh, you know, like I was absolutely amazed at how good of a job it was doing. Um, it just it just worked, right? And then we found out that it corrupted something. So if if that small piece can be fixed, I think it would be amazing. That that's what it was corrupting. Yeah. Well, again, I just want to go back to this. Uh, where I show the corruption. So that data column is of type text. Um, it is JSON inside. Um, that's basically because we uh, wrote this on uh, PG91, so it didn't have the JSON type um, and doesn't have, certainly didn't have JSON B type. If we were gonna do it today, we would use JSON B there, but um, that was not there. But it's just, I don't know that. I don't know that. All I know is that the specific text that I have was not copied exactly as it should have been. So I don't know what property it was about the text that made that happen. Well, this, this, one, didn't, this one didn't have any other text types, so I can't, I can't answer that. Uh, well, we don't use Varkar anywhere, because text is basically the same in Postgres, so. Um, we have some fixed length car values that we use, but we don't have any Varkar anywhere. Any, anything variable length, we use text. Um, so on the on the, the worm database, the timeline database, um, 
this one here. Um, so we're going to do a basically a dump restore. That's the first step. Um, and then once that's finished, we're going to bump the sequence numbers so that anything past this point, there's a window where anything writing to the old database will write into that window of sequence numbers. Um, but at the same time we do that, we're going to update the DNS. So all the applications will start moving over here and, and writing after that bumped sequence number. Once we see that all of the writes are gone off of the old master, we'll take a dump of the new records. So anything basically inside that window, we'll take a dump of that and move it over. But, but you're right that anything reading from this side won't have the things that's in that window, but that's acceptable. Yeah. But it's not acceptable in the second database, which is why we need the, to stop everything, do the dump restore. And, uh, and do it that way, which again sucks. It was not the plan. The plan was to use DMS for both of them. Um, and the payment database switch was going to be a, a bit different strategy for sequence numbers, but it was still going to work. What was the other uh, database migration service. <laughs> um, if I had to do it more than once, maybe, <laughs> but I only have to do it once. And honestly, I'd rather make, uh, help make the DMS service better. So, yep. Sorry? Yep. No, 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 it's, it's part of a, an extension um, called UUID-OSSP. That's the original one, but the one we're using now is part of PG Crypto. So and both of those extensions are supported at, uh, in AWS RDS. Um, the, only, the only piece that I think is missing um, is the ability to reference functions inside a, a supported extension. No, that was f that was for something else. We, we use sequence numbers for for some things, and we use uh, UUIDs for something else. Basically, anything that an external client is going to see, we use a uh, UUID. We don't give away the internal numbers. So, anything else? Any better ideas on what I should do here? <laughs> yeah. What is it called? Oh, right. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll look into that. Good. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>